Hayden, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. I read your email and I knew that your story would be something that would really help a lot of people. And so I'm super excited to have you on. Awesome. I'm excited too. I do got to say, it's kind of a little bit surreal because, you know, I've been listening to your podcast for like six months now and it's weird to actually have the voice talk back to me. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. Well, yes, it's, I love when we have like a but listeners that come and share their stories. It's, it's super fun. So I love it. <laughs> well, okay. Let's, let's go ahead and jump in. I'd love to hear just your background. I mean, you obviously have you know, you know, the ropes around here. So would love to hear your story. Yeah, my name's Hayden and I was born in Idaho Falls in 2000. So I'm currently 23 years old and I am a student up at or BYU Idaho. Um, right now I'm studying for, it's called biomedical sciences. Just a fancy way to say I'm going to pre-dental school or I'm going to dental school. At least trying nice. to. Anyway. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. So that's kind of the goal right now. But and you're question. you're married and you have a baby that's gonna get here any day. Yeah. Yeah. That's the most exciting part. So I already have I am married and I already have one daughter. Her name's Peyton. She's two years old and she's just like the most full of life little girl you could ever hope for. Oh, she's she's that. just the cutest. I think every parent's scared that their kid's gonna be like a bad kid or something like that. And she's literally been the exact opposite. She's oftentimes been like the one thing I can look forward to every day or just to kind of relax. And wow, I mean, she is, she is a toddler. She is a toddler, yeah. but <laughs> that's awesome. Well, let's jump into your, your story, your faith journey and hear all about it. Yeah. The real development kind of starts when I was five years old, to be honest. So to give you a little bit of background, I grew up in a pretty, an atypical home, if you will, just because I didn't have the mom dad figure. My mom's been married and separated from a few, a few separate times. We've moved a lot, but kind of starting at the beginning of that, um, when I was five years old, my parents separated for, or my my biological parents separated. I, you know, I, honestly, I don't remember a whole lot of it because I was so young. I mean, I remember my mom telling us, but besides that, I don't really have any good sol solid memories until I'm like eight years old or so, naturally. But that being said, my dad was still prevalent. He was still around. I think for a couple of years, we didn't see him. But to my knowledge, he was always there because that's all I can remember. Once my mom remarried in 2008 to another guy, he was, an he was a really, really awesome example for me growing up. That marriage did last about three or four years, and he taught me so many amazing things. And most importantly, I think, is he gave me a good foundation in the church. Uh, he was kind of, he was a pretty active person himself, and he got us going. And almost every Sunday, I think we were going to church, and he held callings, and it was, that was kind of just the standard for us as we'd go every Sunday. In fact, I do remember one Sunday when I was like, who knows, six, seven, eight, I went and I was already in my little three-piece suit as a little kid, and I go and knock on my parents door and I open the door and say oh are we going to church and my mom's like oh you know they called and they said it's canceled today just because you know they wanted to like sleep in and they they no one else was near nearly close to ready I was like oh darn I guess it's canceled today <laughs> and I just <laughs> I did my little seven-year-old thing up until that point it was a pretty good household to be raised in I mean I have three older sisters so I'm the youngest and we were all more or less pretty close and I was specifically closest with the one that was closest in age to me her name's Whitney and we would do a lot of stuff together. But once that marriage ended, unfortunately, we did move again. And while we were in while we were in a different house with my mom being separated, kind of the first big pivotal point for me was in 2011, I think it was, my sister had just gotten back for the sister Whitney. She'd just gotten back from girls camp. And we had a huge plan, huge trip planned to go down to Las Vegas with my dad, all of my siblings. And all of us were supposed to go, but her just haven't gotten back from girls camp. And she did like a, another camp a week before that. She's like, oh, I'm tired. I'm not going to get to go. It's like, oh, no, no worries. Me and my other sisters, we took off down to Las Vegas with my dad. And right as we pulled up to Las Vegas, we got a, my dad got a phone call. And the phone call was that when he had been hit. But she had been hit on in a boating accident. What happened was she was being pulled on an inner tube behind behind her boat. And if you can kind of imagine, there's like um uh there's a blind corner that makes a big U shape. 
and she was being pulled behind, and their boat came up to the tip of the U. They flipped a Yui, and they whipped her tube around the corner with another girl on it, and because it was a blind corner, there just happened to be another boat there, and the tube and her boat collided. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Yeah, it was, it was a hard time. But Whitney was the first one to get hit, and then Whitney hit the other girl on the tube, and, of course, they both fell off in the water, and everyone's freaking out and panicking. Granted, I wasn't there, so I don't know the exact the frame-for-frame details, but... I do know they managed to pull her out of the water. The driver of her boat reacted pretty quickly and luckily were able to keep her head above water. They didn't want to like pull her up into the boat, I believe, just because, you know, they don't know what kind of injuries. But it was apparent pretty quickly that it was not good. They got her to shore and they got her life flighted to the nearest hospital over in Idaho Falls. And the brain damage was severe. All her teeth had been knocked out and they were down into her lungs. And there just wasn't. Oh, I mean, there was my gosh. Cancer. We got in consultation from a couple different people, but the overall statistic was she probably wasn't going to make it. They could try, but she probably wasn't going to be a good outcome. If she did come back, likely she'd be a vegetable for life. Hmm. So my mom had to make the decision. And my mom, she was, you know, she's all alone. She has her family, but she doesn't have a spouse. And she has these four kids. And now one of her kids is dying. And she had to make the call to be able to pull the plug. And that was, that's, that, I remember that pretty clearly. That, that whole sequence of fence is pretty well stained in my mind. Um, We went to, we were there at the hospital and as we were saying goodbyes and it didn't really look like her, of course, because of the trauma. But I do remember the whole night she had been, um, due to hemorrhaging in the brain, she had some, she had a bunch of tears coming out and they were all bloody tears due to the excess blood. But I do remember when we were saying goodbye, we did get one clear tear and, it was just like a final goodbye. Mm-hmm. And then pre- or proceeding that, we uh, did the funeral and everything. And life, more or less, I mean, it kind of just has to keep on going, right? You don't really have a choice. Really, my poor mom, she was back to work four days after because, again, mm-hmm. she's a single mom and she has these three other kids she still has to care for. So we did the funeral and she's back to work. And I wish I could say we became the super close-knit family. I think we did have a better appreciation for each other, to say the least. But we weren't like, ah, oh, you know, spending time with each other and just really building up those relationships. And that was probably because my mom had to be gone as much as she was to be able to to provide for us. And gosh, there'd be nights where she'd come home and I'd hear the garage door open. And I don't really know what prompted me to do this. I think it's this world spirit must have been acting on my little 11 year old 12 year old self but she the garage door had opened she'd come up to her room and i'd go up there and i would just kind of like hold her as she was crying and falling asleep because she hadn't she had no one else Mm. and that whole experience definitely created a very strong bond between my mom which was even to this day is phenomenal i mean me and my mom are almost best friends at the same time my mom decided or at the same time she had been dating someone and just kind of out of the craziness and hecticness out of everything she ended up getting married to this guy and we moved down to utah for six months and at that point we hadn't even put a gravestone on my sister's grave and she was already separated from that and it just was not a good experience and this new guy he wasn't an actor number and he wasn't around a whole lot And that's sort of where the activity of our whole family first kind of fell off. That being said, I was old enough to make my own decision about what I wanted to do with the church, right? And I kind of was able to start making active choices. And our church, gosh, it was like a mile and a half away or so. But I remember there were a number of Sundays. I was just like, you know, we should really go to church today. My mom did not want to go at all. Um, And the reason being is we held the funeral processions and everything else inside like a Relief Society room. And as it so turns out, all the Relief Society rooms look the same. So Mm -hmm. we'd go back in there and be a trauma of memory. So I totally understood why she didn't want to go. But I knew I felt happy and I knew I liked church and that was awesome. And so I would try to find some kind of ride, but it was more or less pretty much inactivity, just doing our thing. And that uh, whole deal only lasted about six months till we moved back up to Idaho, came back to live with my mom's parents, my grandparents for a while, while my mom got her deal, her whole situation organized. And again, we became active because we started going with my parents. 
And throughout this whole process, I had sort of really began to think about that whole plan of salvation they kept talking about. And like, oh, what does happen after you die? Like, what do we actually believe? And all of a sudden, this, the, the idea of life after death became such a real topic to me. And I could just start studying it and start learning about it. And I didn't, you know, I wasn't like perusing the Book of Mormon all the time trying to get answers. But I think something I did have is I just had a connection with the Spirit. And the Spirit just gave ideas and was talking to me about what does it, like, what does happen? And that was sort of where the first root of my testimony went grew. And as awful as the whole thing was, and I'm sure a lot of other people will agree who have been through major traumas, you don't know if you change it. Because it was such a defining shape in who you grew up to become and where I am now for that matter. Going forward from there, we did eventually get into our own house and she did end up meeting another guy and we grew, moved up north just 20 or 30 minutes or so. And I started out a new high school there. And again, it was kind of another new beginning after a bunch of other new beginnings follow or preceding that. This was interesting though, because again, my mom still wasn't active. I was 14 or 15 years old. And I think the saving grace here was that number one, I had some amazing young men leaders, like just amazing. And number two is I had some really good friends. We lived, moved into a neighborhood where there were probably three to six other kids my age, and we all just clicked so well. And even to this day, I'm still friends with a number of them just because of the connections we made. They sort of were like the reason I'd go to church, <laughs> just why I like what was my actual motivation. I knew I was supposed to do, go take the sacrament, and I still hit all the benchmarks that you would expect a young LDS boy to hit, you know, baptism, priesthood. And that, I was still doing those, but I'd say it was more or less staying within inactivity, like maybe one every four Sundays or so. And the reason being is I didn't like to go to church alone. I didn't really like to sit there alone. That was kind of hard. You know, looking back now, I'm like, oh, that's kind of silly because how many people in the world go alone? But as a little 15-year-old boy, that was kind of a big deal for me. And, you know, the hard part was is, uh, they were just being nice, but members would come up and go, oh, where's your mom today? I'm like, you know, yeah, she's busy. She's busy. <laughs> and like, gosh, there was one Sunday specifically. I remember I'd gotten up to bless the sacrament. And I struggled with a lot of things a lot of teenage boys struggle with. And I probably wasn't in the position to be blessing the sacrament. This was one a very defining moment because I remember I went to say the prayer, said it wrong. And then went to say it again, said it wrong. Went to say it again, said it wrong. After about three times, the whole ward's like, all right, but someone else said, but let's move on. After that, after they released us to go sit on the benches, I was sitting by myself because I had no one to sit with. And my young men's leader, his name is Zach Miller. If he ever hears this, you're an awesome guy. He's one of my favorite people. He came up and sat next to me. And he could, I don't know if you knew I was having a hard time. I think he just felt prompted to. But I had been sitting there just kind of crying into my hands because I felt bad about myself. And he came and just put his arm on my back. And I was like, that was just the epitome of who I hope to be for some for someone someday is just being that person that's there. And that kind of shaped my view on the gospel a little bit. I was like, whoa, like maybe Heavenly Father does care. Like he does actually love us. I made that decision going forward to serve a mission after I received my patriarchal blessing and got some really good guidance that way. I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but I got a description from my blessing. I was like, whoa, well, that's not who I am right now. <laughs> uh, I got some work to do. Like there's a pretty big gap there, but I knew that's who I wanted to become eventually. I just didn't know how to do it. And so I committed to reading the Book of Mormon before I actually left on my mission. I'd never really read it. And, you know, I'd always heard stories and I was familiar with the stories because I'd gone to Sunday school periodically growing up. Got to third Nephi for the first time ever. I'd only made it to like maybe second Nephi. And then I read about Christ coming down to the Nephites. I was like, whoa, this is phenomenal. And I just received that glowing witness that's, that we so often hear about. It's like, Christ is real. The atonement is real. I should go on a mission. Let's do this. Going forward, I was just like a train. I was like, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. And so I broke up with a girlfriend who I wasn't the best for me at the moment. Changed some friends around. Really just did what I had to do to, to put myself in the right position when I graduated high school that I could go. 
And I didn't waste any time. Like I graduated, I think, in like the end of May and I left a week later. I was sitting in my um, interview with my bishop and I was like, I got to leave the country. Like, I want to leave the United States. He's like, all right, I'll tell the first presidency. And I don't know if he actually did or put it in his file or whatever that process works. But um, they called me to the Philippines, which was about as far as from America as I could go. That was an experience for sure. And all this time, you know, my testimony kind of goes up and down and up and down. But I'd say overall it has a net positive trend. There was another key defining moment to getting me on my mission. And that was one of the summer jobs I had taken while I was in high school was concrete. I was doing concrete work locally. And funny enough, being from Idaho, you can guess what we were building. We were building potato cellars, naturally. We were building, you know, eight or 10 foot tall potato cellars, do all the concrete work. And someone would come in behind us and do the giant tin roofs. About two weeks into that company, I got invited or rather they demanded I leave the state and go and work in North Dakota for a while. And I was kind of excited. I was like, oh, this is my first chance to be away from home. It's kind of exciting. And so I left with this crew of a bunch of guys and we all took off to North Dakota and I was by far the youngest one there. And we just started working. And that was like, we were working like 18 hour days and we'd go home and sleep for five hours and come back and did that for three weeks. But while I was there, I was like, I need to go to church every week while I'm here. I was like, I'm going to do it because that's what an adult should do while they're living on their own. Like, I'm going to do it. None of the guys wanted to give me a ride because no one else was a member. And Sunday was our only day off where we weren't working 16 to 18 hours. So they were all asleep by the time church rolled around. And so I'd either walk to the church or well, whatever I did, whatever I had to do to get there. And that was kind of cool. And I think that catalyzed this next experience, which was while I was out there working, we'd have to carry these concrete forms, which were about I don't know, four feet wide by eight feet tall or so. And you just carry them kind of in front of you or off to your side or wherever you needed to go. In particular, this one time I was walking, long story short, there was a piece of rebarb sticking out of the ground. And I was carrying the concrete form and just doing my thing. And I didn't see the rebarb. And the rebarb like went right into my leg. And it was a fresh cut piece of rebarb, which if you're not familiar, that makes it like like a knife razor blade sharp. And it just went like the bottom of my shin all the way almost to my knee was this huge gash. It was it was a pretty deep cut. I knew it was bad. And up until this point, I had been sick. I just kind of had like a cold and something was going on with my back and whatever. And all throughout this experience, and probably because I'd been trying to go to church and I kind of had God on my mind, every time I was sick, I would just go in a little corner in this potato cellar, bow my head and like, God, I don't talk to you enough. I'm sorry, but can you please take this away so I keep on working? Because if I don't work, they make me pay for a hotel for the night and that's not cool. And it was amazing. This was my first witness in miracles where as soon as I would ask for something to disappear, just be gone. So like, you know, if I was, um, let's say if I felt like, felt like I had to throw up or I did throw up and I'd say, can you take this away? And he'd just take it away and be gone. And that was going on and on and on. There's so many different weird things like spouts of dizziness, uh, spouts of blind, not actual blindness, but you know, like where your vision starts to tunnel. Um, I think it's probably just because I was pushing, we were pushing our bodies so hard. But anyways, when the rebar got stuck into my leg, that was after the fact, all of that happened, and I was like, oh, crap, that's not good. Because, you know, we're not working in a sanitary environment by any means. And I went home that night, and the next day came around, and it was starting to turn yellow, and it was starting to get infected. And I knew enough to realize that's also not good. But I also didn't want to tell my mom because I knew she would demand I come home. I was like, no, I'm an adult. I'll figure it out. As a little 17 year old kid. <laughs> and I remember my leg was just throbbing. It was hurting so bad. And we got home at 10 o'clock that night. And I knelt down the bed, knelt down beside the bed while the guy I was rooming with was in the shower. I was like, I need this gone. Like, can, can you please take this away? Like, I won't be able to finish if I don't. And next, day, next morning I woke up, no infection. It's just completely scared. Wow. Like, all right. Team God, let's, I'm, I'm for this. Let's go. <laughs> that's awesome. Wow, that's amazing. That was another huge defining moment. And 
unfortunately, this is a common theme throughout my life, and uh, it'll appear again. But every time God wants me to do something, it's no gentle nudges because I don't listen. I, I He has to push me pretty hard. And those pushes are usually pretty painful, <laughs> as they often are. So that got my attention. And then I got the patriarchal blessing. I was like, okay, like that's where we're going. And I took off my mission. I took off on my mission to the Philippines. And that was awesome. I really did love it over there. It was hard and it was hot and it was humid, but I don't know. It was just a surreal experience to be able to serve every day. While I was over there, I really started to study for the first time. And I kind of really did utilize that time they dedicate daily to studying the scriptures. And all these random facts I'd heard about the gospel would start to balloon and become huge and massive. And actually, towards the end of my mission, I, I had a bad attitude about something where I was like, I feel like I have learned just about everything I can learn. Which, not true. Ever. Not true. <laughs> not by any means. Yeah, I had learned quite a bit, but that's I was not anywhere to where like uh, a scholar would be or anything. And I felt like, how am I going to continue this when I get home? Like, I, 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 you know, I read something I'm like, okay, I understand it and I get it. And I have these study habits, but while I was out there, I did also start to get really sick. I am just, again, a whole bunch of different ailments. I had to broke a toe, uh, I had infections all over my body. But being a missionary and not being able to work, you realize really quick that like you do love being there and you do care about, like you do care about your job because sitting at home in your apartment without any TV or anything, is that's not, it's not very fun. But every mission ends. And you come home and the real world slaps you hard. <laughs> I was actually um, on my mission during COVID or well, when COVID started and I was far enough along, I think I was out for 22 months and the mission ends at 24 months. And they said, well, congratulations, you get to go home. At the time I was living in like a 400 square foot apartment with six other dudes. I was like, oh my right, gosh, I'm, I'm ready. Let's, let's get out of here. Like my bed yeah. was really, I had to crawl over someone else's bed to get to my bed. It was oh a tiny place, and there was no AC, which it was also oh. the middle of the sea. So I was like, okay, I'm ready. Let's go, let's go home. And I came home, and I mean, the world got me. It's, I don't know. I, there was definitely a disadvantage to where we didn't have church because it was COVID, right? They just, right, right at the crest when everything was coming out in that, um, in March of tw 2020. It wasn't church. Um, there wasn't any of the support systems. There wasn't... Um, we had just, before I left on my mission, we had just moved into the ward like six months prior. So no one like really knew me. They remembered who I was and they did have me do like a coming home speech that I don't know if I still have missionaries do that, but it was like over Zoom with all the members, but you couldn't really go to church for like six months or so. Not that I felt cut off, but I kind of was cut off a little bit and I could have nurtured that myself, right? And I did mm -hmm. maintain some good habits for a while. But through some friends of friends, some old friends from high school, um, I met a guy and he was he did summer sales and he naturally recruited me because I was a missionary and I got down that whole path. I went out to Kansas City, Missouri and was just doing door to door sales out there for a summer right in the height of COVID, which surprisingly wasn't illegal. Thought it would be. It was fine. <laughs> While I was out there, it went well, actually. I know I, I did well enough that I wanted to do it again. Funny enough, though, right before I left to go to Kansas City through some connections, I actually met my wife. We didn't ever actually met in person before I left for Kansas City. But while I was out there, we talked the whole time. And about halfway being out there, I was like, well, this girl's cool. And we started FaceTiming every night. We would just talk and talk and talk, which was a really cool. It's really kind of a cool way to get to know someone where you don't have to you don't have to worry about the date and worry about entertaining each other you can just communicate and talk i guess growing up just kind of like the way i grew up talking about spiritual stuff was weird like even though i'd been on a mission outside of my mission talking about anything spiritual was kind of like oh but it just wasn't the culture of my family we didn't have a lot of the church habits that we would like to have and so Talking to anyone about the church made me feel really awkward. And oddly enough, when I was talking to her, it was just like supernatural. And I was able to share things with her within the first few weeks of talking to her. I was like, well, 
I don't know why like, I wanted to share that with you. Like I recognize that as the spirit for my mission. And we just kind of just pursued that relationship after having talked for almost three months over the phone for hours on end. Once we met each other in person, we're like, yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty sure this is going where we want it to. My wife and I decided pretty quickly when I wanted to get married and we went that whole route. We ended up having an apartment up in Rexburg. And this whole time I was doing school through Utah Valley University, just online, because again, COVID, get no other options. Once I had been invited back to go and do those summer sales thing again, managing a team, or we gave up our apartment, or we're living with my parents just for like a week and a half while that transition was occurring. And it was there we found out my wife was pregnant. And it turns out my wife had something called HG, um, hyper, I think it's called hyperemesis gravidarium. It's, it's brutal. I think in those first three or four months, she lost, remember, she's not 40 pounds, but she didn't have 40 pounds to lose in the first place. To make the matters worse, and this is sort of where um, the downhill begins. I got home from my mission and spiritual high, got married. It was awesome. And life just started to stack on top of us because we're at my parents again. And I'm like, well, I still still got to leave because I'm already committed. We don't have a place to live. She had to stay behind to finish up school. And I had to go and make or provide for our new family, which now we have a baby on the way. So well, now I really got to go provide for our new family. I'm like, all right, um, I'm sorry, but I got to leave you. I love you though. And we're newlywed. We've only married four months and we, she was pregnant and just dying. Like before we hit record here, we were just talking about it. I am pregnant right now, 21 weeks. And my first probably 18 weeks of this pregnancy was so gnarly, <laughs> like so much throwing up. And we were talking about how it's depressing. Like I just would be texting my sisters who just had babies every night, like how much longer is this going to be this way? It's so horrible. So I know that just like oh, what I just went through to have HG is like even much more intense than what I went through. And I'm telling you, it there is not a whole lot that's more miserable than pregnancy sickness. It's horrible. And what the worst part about it, and you can probably relate, Ashley, is it's like, you, you know, you break an arm or you have uh, the flu. And the first couple of weeks, people are like, oh, I am so sorry. You know, you heal up, get better. And then they start to become impatient. And I was guilty of this too. I, I wasn't there to see everything happening, right? Mm -hmm. And you're just like, okay, you're still sick. Cool. You still got to get up and you still got to go to school and you still got to do, yep. do all these things. No one gets it. And so my poor wife, I mean, this was like, this was traumatic for her. Obviously, it was hard for me, but it was like super traumatizing because yeah. she had she didn't have her she didn't have her husband. We you know, we talk a lot, but she was just so miserable, and she would try to go to school, but her school had a policy that if you threw up while you're at school, you had to go home. <gasps> and, and, <gasps> which is like the worst combination with HG because you can't help but throw up. After trying and trying for three months, she was supposed to graduate, gosh, in that July, but it was just, it became obvious after a lot of tears and me trying to, having to be humble, like realizing, oh, like this, it, that's not possible for her. We finally decided that it would be better if she just went on, I think they had a call to leave of absence and she came back or she came and moved out with me in Kansas City and which was good because I was home in the mornings, I could help her. And mm -hmm. she could just be in bed in the evening. I could cook for her and help her that way. But that summer, I was doing sales. It just didn't go amazing. You know, I there was an issue with the guy I was managing with. Um, because of that, there, our team wasn't falling apart. It's just like any management scenario. You know, if you can't yeah. respect your leaders, it's just not going to go well. I had an offer to move back to Idaho and begin doing some, or solar sales, like solar panels on top of roofs, mm -hmm. doing, that, doing that locally. I was like, sign me up, man, because, you know, it's near near family. The baby was going to be doing a couple months and we could just that that would work so much better for us. And so we moved up, moved back to home, had an apartment and our first daughter, Peyton, was born. That was kind of a paradigm shift for me that like what 
do what do I actually want for my family? Like, what do I actually what what are my goals? And I definitely got more focused in work, but not in the church. And I will say again during this time, church had started again because of the nature of when we got married. Her and I never developed super healthy church habits. You know, church was there, but it was social distancing. So it wasn't like you could go and hang out at these word activities. We tried to do Come Follow Me, but we were just more infatuated with each other than we were Come Follow Me at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even when her and I got married, our church, like, we would go, but we wouldn't do anything past that. And then we would go sometimes. And then while she was sick, she would never go. Mm -hmm. And I would try to go by myself. But from my childhood, I still don't like to go alone. Like I will. But it's not my favorite thing to do. Mm -hmm. Now that we have a daughter, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll take her with me. At least it's somebody, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we just never had a chance to develop those good habits because of the circumstances. And I would say my faith was definitely plummeting. And it wasn't like I didn't believe in the church. It was just like I wasn't doing the things to nurture the seed or nurture the tree. And the tree was dwindle or dying and i wasn't aware of it you know i was just so stoked about being a dad and then i got a, I got to be a stay-at-home dad for three months but i did it the wrong way and by that i mean my wife had to go back to school because she hadn't finished and i had to take care of our daughter all day it was the season after covid rsv was like rampant it was one of the worst RSV seasons, but I was scared to take her anywhere because like, oh, I don't want her to go sick. And so I literally sat in my apartment for like three months by myself. I wasn't doing school at that point because I had decided I was going to do sales for the rest of my life. And I just sat with this little baby and played video games and just tried to keep myself entertained. But that sent me spiraling because I'm an extrovert by nature. And I love to talk to people and I thrive off social interaction. I wasn't having any of it. By the time the three months was over, I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll go back to work. I just flung myself into work and I started to do really well. And I started to have a ton of financial success at a pretty young age. I mean, that guy was only 21 at the time. And we started getting these huge paychecks. And as I got better, better at sales in that particular industry, I started to do better and better. And we made the mistake of as our income increased, we decided to increase our lifestyle with it. So we were like, oh, well, if I'm making X amount of dollars per month, we shouldn't live in an apartment. We should have a house. <laughs> and so we decided to break our contract, pay the X amount of thousands of dollars to do that. And we decided to get a house, which oddly wasn't too much more expensive, but it was more expensive. And we were just not smart with our money, like at all. And it was during this time of extreme financial success that we were experiencing. Again, we'd go to church sometimes, but that was like definitely our all-time low on our church record. And I wasn't feeling the spirit anymore. I was just kind of, I was chasing after this goal that more money, more money, more money. And that was like sort of the apple of my eye. The company I was working for, they didn't have a very consistent sales team. So it ended up being that like I was the sales guy for this this whole company that was installing and selling solar panels. And so when I wouldn't do good, they wouldn't do good. And then I'd get a lot of pressure from my boss and my manager like, hey, you need to go out and sell and you need to do this and this. I'm like, okay, I'll go do it because I'm a yes man. And I'd go and do it and I'd work crazy amount of hours, get a crazy amount of sales, and then I'd be burnt out. And it would this ebb and flow. And I felt this happening to me. It was really gross. The keeping up with the Joneses attitude, like comparing yourself to others, I was doing it all the time. And I think that was because I was like this, you know, we were 21, had a kid, and we were living in this neighborhood with the youngest couple, closest couple was like 29 or 30. And I felt like I had something to prove, but not in a good way. Like, I was like, oh, you know, I need to, I need to get a nicer car so they know, they know I'm doing okay. And, you know, we need to do this so they know I'm doing okay. When reality is no one cares, right? No one cares what kind of car you drive. No one cares how much, what kind of stuff you have in your house. No one cares what vacation you're on. I mean, it's cool to tell people when it's fun, but your neighbors usually aren't like, oh my gosh, did you see what they got to do? Oh, they got it. They got a Jeep. Oh, that's so cool. I, it was weird because we were like the epitome of secular success, but we are at like rock bottom on emotional and spiritual success. And me and my wife were just not happy. Like she had postpartum depression for sure. 
I, ever since um, I had done the stay home dad thing, I definitely had some depression and I finally decided to get help because depression runs in my family. So I was familiar with the signs like, okay, I need to go talk to someone about this. This isn't right. And I was having like anxiety attacks in my car, which I've always had some anxiety, but I've never had an anxiety attack, which is weird because like all of a sudden you're fine. And the next thing you're like, oh, I'm going to die. Uh, uh, what's going on? Like the fight or flight just turns on for absolutely no reason. And you start worrying about the smallest things. And I was like, man, this really sucks. And I went and got help. The the counselor guy, he was super helpful. I slowly started to climb out of this pit, but I didn't start fixing the spiritual aspect. I was just like, well, oh, I feel better. I don't know if I'm happy, but at least I'm not having anxiety attacks, which is good. You know, every other Sunday or every third Sunday, but we should go to church today. Yeah, that'd be a good thing. We'd go and then come home. And then we were the Sunday Mormons. She never wanted to go and talk to someone necessarily, but she did eventually start to do better. And then we got like the biggest hit yet. And it was in the fall of 2022. So this was pretty recent. I went to my boss and I was like, hey, boss, can I get another check? I knew they'd been having some financial problems with the company, but I didn't understand to what extent. And he brought in an investor and him and the investor sat me down. And they're like, all right, Hayden, so we see that we owe you about 20000 I was like, whoa, no, 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 no. You owe me like almost 90000 He's like, huh? And they looked it over and they're like, oh, crap. Yeah, we do owe you 90000 I was like, cool. Okay. So he's like, well, Hayden, I guess we owe you 90000 Uh, Yeah, we can't pay that. That's not going to happen. I was like, oh. And remind me, remember, I was on the system where when I was out of money, I'd come and ask for a check. So... <laughs> We didn't have any money in the bank account. And I was like, well, that's not good. And our monthly expenses at that point, because we were being dumb, it was high. Even just being a three-family household, we were spending a lot on top of that. They gave me an option. They said I could walk right then and I could try to sue them for it and maybe I'd get it when I get it. And I was like, well, that sounds like a pretty good idea to me. <laughs> but they gave me another option, which was sort of the only way I could like survive in that moment being because if I went the other way they wouldn't I'd get no money right the next option was they would put me on salary they take that 90 or 80 thousand dollars and they'd give it to me on monthly disbursements and then every sale going forward they'd give me pennies on the dollar pretty much like it was like a thousand dollars per sale instead of you know these giant commission checks I was used to being in the situation we're in we're still we went didn't own the house we were renting the house um, and we had our car payments and everything else and our super high monthly. And I was like, that's probably the best choice. I did think to pray. And I, I was trying to reach out to God at this point because this was like a super humbling thing. But I think it was out of self-preservation rather than like doing it because I should, you know. Mm -hmm. We decided to take the option of what the, the worst option of taking the disbursements because that would get us over for the time being. And I did that for, I don't know, a month or so, month and a half. And it came, became apparent they were about to go under. And this is quarter like kind of that old saying, like fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Because out of every sale I made after that, I never saw a dime. The only money I saw was the, the monthly disbursements. And that was being funded by this investor. But he was managing his books so poorly. Uh, that wasn't going to get fixed overnight. So that was a young and dumb mistake for sure. I jumped to another company. And then a week and a half later, they closed up shop because it wasn't working. And the unfortunate thing is, is a lot of people go like, well, why did you sue him? I was like, <laughs> tried that. But he had so many hard money loans, which are like shark loans, that they took priority in getting paid first. So when he did eventually declare bankruptcy, there was no money for me. Like I could have been went through the courts, but I just went and ended up with a lawyer bill. I talked to a bunch of lawyers about it, unfortunately. But the summation of that was we're broke, like super broke. We came up with a plan pretty fast. Get out of our contract because we found out we could have someone move in for us. They could take over and then we could move in with my parents. And my parents were super gracious to like help us out because and we were just racking stuff up on credit cards because we didn't have a choice. You know, bills were coming in. We had to pay something somewhere. I went into sort of a frantic frenzy mode and my mental health again just die bombed. And I wasn't even thinking about church anymore. I was just like, oh, we got to fix this. Like, oh, I'm a father. 
I put us in this position. What are we going to do? Uh, and I felt a lot of pressure to get to fix this somehow. And the reality was there just there wasn't a fix. It was just do the next best thing. And I started selling everything. Like I sold our forks and I sold our plates. <laughs> and I sold our dishware. And I was like, we got to we got to come up with the money. And we sold everything that wasn't an absolute necessity while we lived with my parents. And that put a dent in it, but it wasn't enough to cover everything. And then I realized, oh, well, I have some money in some retirement accounts because I was smart enough to do that, I guess. I wasn't smart enough to spend money, right? But I put some money in retirement accounts and I had some, I had like three or four little nest eggs I had been building up and I liquidated everything. And one miracle number one was it was just enough to cover everything. Everything we'd racked up, it was just enough. I was like, whoo. And then the other thought came to me and was like, whoa, I probably should pay tithing, but I don't have 10%. I don't know if I can do that. And I did, I did try working for another solar company, but there were a number of things that had shifted in the industry that I no longer believed in it. Plus this whole thing had happened and I kind of had a bad taste. And, or even if I did make a sale, it would be about three months till I got paid out on it. So it, we did eventually get out of our house. We did sell everything and we still live with my parents to this day, like a, almost a year and a half later. But once we got to my parents, that was actually the real challenge. Not because of my parents. My parents are awesome. They're super, very helpful. And like I said, my mom and I have a super good relationship. Me and her current husband, um, he, I mean, him are super good relationship. He pretty much raised me throughout my teens, taught me a ton about just being a good human being. But what the struggle was, was first of all, we both went through another major loss. It's not the worst thing. I mean, we, you know, we still had our kid. We still had our health. We were doing all right. But we lost a lifestyle unwillingly. And we lost something we'd become addicted to, which was spending money. And just like with any other addiction, and I don't, I hope I don't sound blasphemous when I say this, when the fact that like, I call it an addiction, but it wasn't by any means the same level as like a drug addiction. Like I know you've experienced or many, so many others have experienced, but it was something, a pattern, a habitual pattern that we were stuck in. And it was hard not spend anything and to not like not just go get these things that were thousands of dollars on a whim because we wanted to. And even just like on a day to day, like you don't realize how much money you're spending until you don't have the money to spend. And my wife and I just could not come to terms with each other on how to make this happen. We both saw it as an issue. And just like so many other things, when you have one big issue, all the little branches start to stem, you know, this comes up and that comes up and that's a problem. And this is a problem. And we were both like really, really miserable for a few months. Just absolutely. Like we could not, we almost couldn't even get along with each other. And that was hard because like I saw our marriage essentially falling apart. I'm like I'm only 22, man. Like I, I can't, I can't get to like, I have a kid and I've gone bankrupt quote unquote not actually but i've gone bankrupt and i don't want to like i don't want to split for my wife i love my wife like she's awesome and we eventually both agreed to get marriage counseling which was awesome it was phenomenal for us and i think just having someone else there to kind of help out smooth the middle ground and make help us understand that we were communicating differently again throughout this whole process we weren't praying we weren't doing any kind of studying we were pretty much just relying upon ourselves we had, before we lost everything, though, we had bought a vacation to go to the Philippines where I served my mission. And I was going to bring my mom and my wife with us. And I paid for another companion of mine who lives over there to come up and travel with us to kind of help out with the language barrier. And we went on that trip kind of in the midst of us being through this. And for her and I, it just wasn't awesome. Like we were kind of bickering the whole time. And it was just sad because I knew this is something she would love to do and it's something I would love to do. We just weren't on the same team anymore. Like we were playing for different sides, it felt like, and each side was our own. I can say for sure I was playing for my own side. She was probably still trying to play for us. Uh, I still still kind of had that chip on my shoulder a little bit. Like, I'm, I'm going to fix this. This is how things need to be. I was trying to put some pretty strict rules in place, which you don't put rules on your spouse. Like, that's not healthy. I'm sure I was probably the problem. Even my, even the companion we were traveling around with, he was like, dude, are you okay? Like, 
Like some, something's going on here. I'm like, tell me about it. I know. Like this is a problem. <laughs> well, we got home and we did. We started that counseling when everything had gone downhill. Um, a long story short is ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be an orthodontist. It's kind of weird. I gave an 11 year old boy. I was like, I'm gonna be an orthodontist. I don't know what 11 boy, 11 year old boy wants that, but that's what I wanted. And I'd abandoned that dream to do sales. And then my mom just so happened to have married a dentist when I was 14, while I still wanted to be an orthodontist. I was like, cool, that's fun. And the opportunity opened back up for me to join him in practice at his dentist office. And and we had just lost everything. I had no plan for my future. And I was like, that sounds like a really good idea. And I already know I like to do it. I already think it's really cool. And I was like, I'm, I'm, I think we're going to start that track again. And so I started school just last April. And BYUI is really cool. Now, for anyone who doesn't know anything about the, the school-ran colleges, is their mission is to make a disciple of Christ of every student. And I still sort of had that stigma of like, ooh, talking about church is kind of weird. Being up at the school, it sort of was uncomfortable for me a little bit. It's kind of like how, you know, they say in the final days, we'll pretty much judge ourselves and we'll be where, we'll put ourselves where we're comfortable, right? And I was definitely in a, in a situation where I wasn't super comfortable. Like I thought it was cool where we were praying at the beginning, the beginning of class. And I thought it was cool our teachers could talk about God. But I was like, this is like not what I've ever experienced in my life. Like, and all the students were like more or less religious and they were so willing to talk about God. And so I, like, I was developing friends who could talk about God. I was like, oh, this is still kind of weird. And as my seed of faith had diminished, naturally something had replaced it. And it was this seed of doubt. And I guess where it really began was actually my mission. It's kind of weird. But I remember I was reading the Saints book. And funny enough, Ashley, I did, you actually just mentioned this passage like, I don't know, two podcasts ago. Yes. I, yeah, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Yep. It was the part in the Saints book where Joseph Smith, he didn't tell Emma about getting sealed to this other lady because he knew Emma wouldn't approve. Or once Emma finally did give approval, he pretended that it hadn't happened. And then they got resealed. And then, you know, on my mission, I was like, I knew prophets weren't perfect, right? That I, that was already very clear to me. And I was like, oh, that, that's a guy who's just using his position to get out of a sticky situation with his wife. Like, I more power to him because I could see myself doing the same thing reasonably. <laughs> but that was, and no, nothing on the Saints book. The Saints book is awesome. But that was the first seat I was like, well. Oh. That is kind of, that's kind of a weird, it's a weird thing. That was a really weird thing. Whether I knew it or not, because I hadn't been nurturing my seed of faith, the world around me had been nurturing the seed of doubt. And as my wife and I had been through these traumas and everything else, I mean, this seed of doubt had pretty much turned into a tree more or less. And it wasn't that I'd go to church and be like, whoa, what they're saying is just false. What they're saying is wrong. It was more so as I think about certain doctrines those questions would come up. I'm like, what did happen with like the priesthood back then? And like, you know, with the blacks and the priesthood and what did happen with polygamy and what did happen with, you know, X, Y, Z. We had some family friends that came out as um, homosexual and I was like, but they're still like really, I like those guys. They're really cool. And my mom has a ton of questions too. And she'd ask me these questions because I've always been like, I don't know, more spirit, kind of the more spiritually inclined in the family. So I don't know if she'd ask, like get an answer or just ask to ask. But I would try to come up with an answer, but I realized, oh yeah, I don't really have an answer to that. And these issues started to become really prevalent for me. And they got to the point where I wasn't sure, like I'd, I'd always had a pretty strong testimony of the Book of Mormon. And never a super strong testimony of Joseph Smith, which I know is a weird thing. Like I believed in the restoration. I believe that happened. I believed he translated the Book of Mormon. I always thought the Book of Mormon was cool. I just started to doubt Joseph Smith and that he was, was acting for the better good. I had started to ignore these feelings I was having because I was like, oh, I know what those are. Like th those are the feelings of like doubt and uh, you know whatever. And I had a number of family members who left the church from a sister to an uncle to a number of other people I'd known. Well, I started to take a hard look at their lives. And I was like, well, they're not unhappy. Like, they seem fine. But, you know, those are bad thoughts. Like, we shouldn't have those thoughts. And that went on for a few months. 
until finally it got so bad that one day I was driving to church and these thoughts were just racing to me. I almost had a pit in my stomach about going to church. And I was just like, man, I don't know about this. Like, I don't, like, I know I've done the mission and I've done all these other things, but I just, I don't know. I don't know if I believe this anymore. I don't, I don't know if I can live in a lie. And it was at that moment I realized like, holy cow, I'm on my way out. Like I already had one foot out the door. I was like, okay. And I didn't look at myself and say, you need to stop. I'm like, this is happening. I can address that this is happening. I need to figure out like what it is I actually want. And if that life isn't in the church, then I guess that's what I'll do. If where was your wife at during this time? Like, was she aware of where, how you were feeling and what was her feelings about it? Throughout the HD, of course, she wasn't active. And then she had never really taken like a super active role in like saying like, we're going to go to church. Like we're going to read our scriptures. And I did ask her at one point, I remember one day we were driving to church and I like turned to her or I think we were just driving through town. I was like, you know, hon, do you, what do you think about the church? And she's like, oh, it's cool. I'm like, yeah, it was cool. But like, what do you like about it? And she was like, well, uh, you know, I like these things. And I was like, okay, well, what do you think about, and I told her some of these questions. She's like, you know, I don't really know. I was like, and then she said, that's not really important. And I was like, well, it's kind of important to me. <laughs> and I don't think I'd ever really had a full converse, like a in-depth conversation about what was happening. So I didn't want to feel like I was burdening her. And I, like, I didn't want her to end up leaving the church with me deciding to stay. And that was catalyzed by like me talking to her about this stuff. So I kind of just kind of kept it to myself. So I didn't want to want these issues to occur. What? started to happen right as I like started to have this crisis my this faith crisis where I realized like I was almost kind of done with the church so I mentioned my sister passed away and her name was Whitney and throughout my mission I had developed a pretty good connection with both the spirit and then there were times where I even felt she was where Whitney was there and it just felt different. It didn't feel like the spirit. It was just like a, a happiness. Uh, I couldn't, can't really put words to it. And I'd become very familiar with her presence. And then once I came away from my mission and that uh, declined because I wasn't maintaining my spiritual nature and I didn't really hear much from her anymore. But I remember one day I was sitting in the chemistry hall of my school and I was studying organic chemistry. And I was just kind of doing my thing. And I looked up and I saw an old family friend who I hadn't seen uh, in six, no, probably like eight years. And him and I had gone on a cruise. Our two families had gone on cruises when we were younger, when my parents first got married. And I met him that way. And we chatted for a while. And he had had some crazy stuff happen to him. Like he was paralyzed. And then he came out of paralysis. And it was a super like raw spiritual moment for us. I was like, you are an amazing person. Then he's like, oh, can I text him? You know, we can stay in contact. I was like, yeah, if you need help with this chemistry class, I've taken that and it sucks, but I can help you if you want. And he texted me, looked down at my phone. I just turned white and he could tell something was wrong. I was like, and he was like, what, what, what? I was like, uh, um, I don't know how to tell you this, but the number he had texted me from, he somehow had gotten my dead sister's phone number. Oh my gosh. So I was like, I was shook. And I already texted my mom's like, what number do you have for Whitney? And she sent me her number. And I was like, yeah, that's the number. And I told him and I was like, whoa, that was like the first real smack in the face I'd gotten from spiritually in a while. Wow. Well, that, I didn't, I didn't think much of it. And it was a really cool experience. And obviously I told a bunch of people and, but I was still in the faith crisis going forward. I didn't want to look at resources. Like I knew what the anti-material was. I knew what the CES letter was. I knew a bunch of this stuff. And I didn't want to dive into it because I knew it was very persuasive. And I knew it could also be very one-sided. And it didn't always present the facts in the best way. And I also know there's some history I'm not totally familiar with. And I didn't want to dive into it unless I knew that's the route I want to go. I sort of wanted this to be a decision that came from within, from my spirit spiritual side, if you will, because I knew I loved God. I knew I wanted God in my life. I just didn't know if that looked like the church or if that looked somewhere else because I'd, I'd been in Idaho my whole life and I'd done the mission and this was my exposure more or less to religion. And I didn't know if I should go start looking somewhere else. 
this was also kind of scary because I'm going to BYUI. So to be a student, obviously, you more or less have to be part of the church. Not have to be, but there is the option. It's what everyone does. And I was like, well, if I left, that would like really throw my family through another loop because we have to find a new living situation because we only live with my parents if I'm going to school. But I was like, I, either way, I got to make a decision because I can't go to school at this religion school and pray and say all these things if I don't believe it. The next week, this was in the spring, I decided to take my daughter on a hike. She was about one and a half, so she couldn't hike, but we had like a little thing that could strap her in so she could sit on my shoulders. That was super fun. She loved that. But we went to a place called the Manam Butte, and I hiked up to the top. I decided to watch the sunset, which I don't know why I thought that was a good idea with like a little baby who has a bedtime. But I decided that's what we're going to do. And my wife was gone that night, so her and I, I took her. We went to the Meat Butte and we hiked up this butte and we sat at the top and was like, watch the sunset. But while we were up there watching the sunset, there was another couple sitting there. And I started talking to them and they were playing with my kid and they were really cute about it. And I got to know him and he was from Blackfoot or something like that. And she was from Florida. Now, this is where it got weird was I don't even know how this came up, but we started, I somehow mentioned that I had had a sister who passed away and the girl who was from Florida had come up to Idaho periodically to visit her grandma around the 4th of July. Now, the accident with my sister happened happened on July 11th. This girl had just so happened to be on the lake that day. Who was from Florida? And she was like, oh, I was there. I was like, oh, wait, you're... my gosh. I was like, oh, man, we're two for two here. This is getting kind of weird, right? And the logical part of me we did want to chop it up to coincidence. But I also was starting to get the hint like, there, I need a sign. Like so something's going on here. And then kind of go back to what I said. You know, when God needs my attention, I don't take gentle nudges. I take shoves. <laughs> well, going forward from that point in time, I work at Olive Garden as a server now, just as a something to bring in to meet our monthly bills. And I w was working in a section that usually is there till the very end of the night. And I decided that night that my wife and I should go to Chili's to get their lava cake, their ice cream lava cake, which was actually where um, Whitney, every every birthday, that's where she wanted to go. And that's where she would want, that was the dessert she wanted. And I have no idea just why I decided that, like, oh, I should get that that night. And I didn't know if I was going to make it. My wife was at a play practice or a musical practice, and I was at working, and I was probably going to be working late. But, like, two hours early, my manager came up to me, and he was like, hey, we're going to cut you tonight. You can go. And when I was like, we're still busy. But he's like, yeah, you know, you can just go, whatever. Anyways, I walked out the door to go to this restaurant and go get my wife, and a bright red car was sitting in the parking lot, like right out the doors. And on the license plate said WIT, like W-H-I-T, which was my sister's nickname. And I was like, are you serious? Like, really? Well, okay. I was like, okay, I get it. Like, you got my attention. <laughs> I, I understand now. Like, you want me to do something. All the more, it was like on the one night. I never go to Chili's, by the way. It's not my favorite restaurant. I don't really like it there all that much. But it was the one night I decided to go and get this, my sister's favorite dessert. And there's like the biggest, the most obvious sign of them all. I was like, okay, I get it. You're reaching through. And so me and my wife got the dessert and it was delicious in case anyone's wondering. But going forward, I really started to feel like, hey, what is it? Like, well, you have my attention. What am I going to do? And... I just got like the most clear answers, like go to the temple. I was like, okay, I will. <laughs> I was like, this might be the last time I go to the temple because I was, wasn't was really sure if I wanted to stay in the church or not. But I was like, I'll go. And it took me longer than it should have. But I think after like a week or two, I finally got the appointment, found some time in my school schedule, got up there, did, did a session, and I was just sitting in the celestial room. And I was like, wasn't really expecting it, but I was half expecting like a vision or something because of like the degree of the degree of obviousness of all the other signs. I was like, whatever you tell me to do, I will do it. This is kind of directed at God because I didn't really like, I, don't, I didn't expect my sister to say anything. But I was like, Cam, hey, once I got the celestial, I'm ready. 
Like I will 100%. You tell me to do something, I will do it. And I sat there for like, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I was like, nothing, nothing's coming to me. And I'm, I, I, at this point, I was really starting to remember what the spirit felt like and what promptings felt like. And because I just still, I felt a lot of that on my mission. All of a sudden, after like, look, just sitting there for almost 45 minutes, just like, boom, like a bus. It was like, you need to be in the church. I have a lot of plans for you. You need to be here. And I was like, all right, I'll that 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 is what I will do. I'm sorry it took this long to get to me. <laughs> and it's like a light switch after that. You could even ask my wife. She's like, different person. Ever since that moment, I was like, I had conviction, not just in school, but like being a better husband and helping out and just trying to shape up to be the all-around person that I wanted to be. And things I'd never been able to accomplish in my life before, I suddenly started to do as I made, you know, as I'd made this decision to really, really be part of the church and make that a priority in my life. I've never been able to go to the gym consistently. And all of a sudden I had this motivation to go and I haven't stopped going for like a year now. I finally had a motivation to eat healthy and I finally understood how that works. Like, oh yeah, you can't eat too many calories and you'll lose weight. Because so I had gotten to be, I wasn't severely overweight, but I was getting to be overweight. And ever since then, it has just been like a trajectory upward. And I'm so stoked every time. Every time I think about this, I'm like, how amazing is it that God would pierce the veil for me to get my attention, to get me back on track? And when I say like, he has these plans for me, I don't expect, you know, I don't expect to be any grandier callings, but the people I can help or the members I can influence, the, the lives I can change. I want to be that person and I want to work towards that person. And again, I can't say after that, it was like, a, oh, I do everything so perfectly now. Like, you know, I still struggle with scripture reading and we, our church attendance has gotten a lot better. Like we go a lot and I actually participate and our temple attendance has gotten a lot better and we're trying, we're striving to do better. And even with my wife, my wife got pregnant again. She had HG again. She got really sick. And I had this chance to just serve her and serve her and serve her. I was here this time for it. So that was nice. <laughs> and I got to serve her. And this built like an amazing connection between us. Despite being at an all-time secular low, we were at an all-time emotional and relationship high. And just seeing this contrast that occurred in just a few months was amazing and was the biggest testimony builder to me. I think one of the things you said earlier on about the the young men's leader that put his arm on your shoulder and how you wanted to be somebody like that. And when you were talking about that, what was going through my head was it's crazy how impactful those youth leaders can be. You know, it's crazy how he is somebody that you've remembered all this time and you've been on a mission, you've done all these things. And like, and so now when you're talking about this experience that you had, it just makes me wonder what kids are you going to like impact their life in a way that nobody else could have, or, you know, maybe who knows what it is, but it's like those people, you know, they stay with you. Like I have people like that in my life that just were a pillar of light for me at a certain time. And you never know, like it's, it's just a, it's a church calling and you just go do your thing, but you just, you never know if you're going to be that person that they remember for the rest of their life. Yeah. And honestly, you know, when this happened, I was like, oh, no, I, I, want, I want a calling now. Like, I, I really do want to dedicate some time to the church. And God being God, he was like, oh, well, I, I know what you need. And he gave me like the most least demanding calling possible. Like, I call, I wanted to get with the youth because I, I had that same thought. I was like, I can influence the youth. I can be such a force for good. Well, it turns out that when you're studying for dental school, it eats up the vast majority of your schedule. So it's probably good I didn't get this super vital calling because I just don't have the time nor the energy to be able to really give my all to that. But I know right now I can use that time to prepare myself and to gain experiences and try to shape myself into this person that does have the capability to help someone, help a youth who's struggling be able to teach my daughters and my and my wife and whoever else is willing to listen to me like hey here's how here's how we do this here's how we can change and here's how we can influence and my understanding of topics of the gospel that 
never really made sense to me before. Like the atonement. Oh my gosh. That is just like the most in-depth and coolest thing. And the understanding of Christ's condescension to the earth is just, it's revolutionary in my mind. That's probably been the number one anchor point since I've come back, if you will, or decided uh, what my course would be from here on out. You have an amazing story. I, I'm i so glad that we had you on the podcast today. I'm so glad that your wife's going into labor just like all worked out for us to have you on. How the story all ended up, it just like blew my mind. Like I wasn't anticipating all, how the turns and twists went. So I wasn't either. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your story and for taking the time to come on. And thank you for emailing me. In the midst of me trying to make this decision of where I should go or like what I should do, I was like, I want to hear what it was like being gone and then why they came back. And so I literally went to the Apple podcast store and I was like, LDS, come back. And guess what <laughs> popped up? <laughs> The Comeback Podcast. And I was like, oh, what's this? And I started to listen to stories. And I've been like kind of addicted since then. Like I go through phases. But like the stories and the experiences people have on here. I was like, whoa. And that's why when I first emailed you, I was like, oh, I don't know if I really qualify for this. Because, you know, there's some people, some amazing stories. And uh, your podcast had did, I think it laid a lot of groundwork for me to see that people do leave. They don't like it. And then they do come back. But it was a new perspective for me. I'd never heard. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you for thank you for adding that in here. You're welcome. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much, Hayden, for coming on the podcast. You are welcome. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you so much for being a supporter of the Comeback Podcast and listening to our episodes. It would mean so much to us if you would like and subscribe to our YouTube channel it helps other people be able to find us and we want to share this message to everyone.